everybody and welcome at episode 14 already from Head in the Cloud, Heart in the Community. My name is Isidora Katanich and I'm a Swiss-based Microsoft MVP and I'm very excited for this next episode because we have an amazing guest uh, on the show. But before I go to my lovely co-host and introduce you to, uh, to our guest, I first want to say thank you to subscriber number 300, um, David Coronel, who's from Montreal in Canada. And of course, thanks to everybody else who has been supporting us on our journey uh, so far. It has been a fantastic ride. Luckily, I've been not been doing it on my own. I have my lovely co-host over in Seattle, USA. So let's head over to Holly, say hi, and introduce our next guest. Hi, everyone. And yes, thank you for all of the subscribers that are following us on this journey. It wouldn't be as much fun if we didn't have all of you. So thank you so much for your support and your love. We send it all back to you. Um, today is a really fun episode. I would love for you to know who I am a little bit. My name is Holly Lehman. Like Izzy said, I am based in Seattle, Washington. Um, it's actually sunny out today, so I'm loving the weather. Uh, that said, I am a PM at Microsoft. I am on the Azure CXP partner team. So um, we have a little bit of love from our MVP community and internal Microsoft tech. So women in tech are bringing it all together for you today. I am excited to introduce our amazing guest today. Christina Warren gets to join us. She is a CDA cloud advocate for Microsoft. You might know her as Film Girl on Twitter. So Christina, the floor is yours. Tell us a little bit about yourself and intro yourself as best because I can't do it as good as you. <sighs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Holly and Izzy. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I, I'm really excited to be guest number 14. And I think that this show that you, you do is, is fantastic. Um, as you said, my name is Christina Warren. I'm a, a cloud advocate um, uh, at Microsoft. And what the CA team does, what kind of uh, we do within developer relations and with advocacy is we try to connect the community and the users and the customers with our product teams and with um, you know the, the things that are happening at Microsoft. So a lot of what I do, it's kind of weird because we have to kind of go like before the pandemic and after, right? Yeah. Like because the job has switched a little bit. And so um, my background, which we're going to talk about, I think a little bit more a little bit later. Uh, before I came to Microsoft, I, I was in digital media for a decade. But my, my uh, so I, I do a lot of public speaking. I um, host a lot of our, our first party events and speak at things like Microsoft Build and Microsoft Ignite and and things like that. I, I do a show called The Speak on Channel Nine, which is like a rundown of all the latest news happening in the developer space. Um, but I've also, I guess over the last, gosh, four years, it's been now since I've been at Microsoft, a lot of what I've done is, is giving talks and, and showing people how to use Azure and, and various technologies and services that we have um, at, at conferences, big and small, but also really trying to engage with the community and figure out where, what are what are the users' pain points? What are things that mm -hmm. maybe they don't know that they can do and point them towards the right resources? Or what are some areas where maybe they're doing something that the product teams don't know that they're doing? And, and I can bring that information back to the product teams and say, hey, you know, this is actually something that's being used a lot. Have you considered this? Uh, you know, giving them that feedback. Um, and uh, But also being able to, on the flip side, go back to users and say, hey, this new feature is coming out and has these things and it might be able to help you and this is how it works. So trying to kind of create that, I guess, uh, um, be a bridge between users mm -hmm. and the people building the tools. That's awesome. That's awesome indeed. You're a busy bee and we love to dive into more of those uh, details of what keeps you busy uh, day and night. Um, so like you said, before you joined Microsoft, uh, you spent over, I believe over a decade in digital uh, media. I've seen um, that you appeared as an expert on CNN, Fox News, BBC, um, Good Morning America, uh, and many more. I mean, that's that's really impressive, especially for somebody based in Europe. It's like, wow, like all these <laughs> big, <laughs> big American shows, right? Um, so can you tell us more about that time and how those experiences help you in your CDA role today? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I love this question because it's really, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, I do have a little bit of, I think, a bit of a different perspective sometimes than some other people who mm -hmm. come into this role because of, of what I did before. And in some ways, it's been really helpful. Some ways, obviously, they're really different, but in some ways, it's really helpful. Yeah, I was a, I was a technology and um, business journalist uh, for, for about a decade. And I was always really technical, and I always really loved knowing tech. And a lot of times what I would do is I would go on TV, and I would explain 
usually they would bring me in because some sort of something happened, you know, with the software or with hardware or just in the general tech industry, they need someone to explain what's happening. And really what they want is they want somebody to tell them, you know, that the world, the sky is falling. And usually I'm the one who's going on. I'm like, no, everything's fine. Occasionally there would be things there's like, no, actually this is really bad. Right. And, and, and the producers love that because they're like, Oh good. This mm -hmm. is scary. But usually I would kind of be the voice of reason. I'd be like, no, 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 no. This is fine. This is what this means. And I would try to break down something that could be complicated and seem scary and, and maybe be overblown, maybe not be um, to a more general audience. And so in that context, that's not that different from what I do as a CDA because you're trying to take complicated and sometimes disparate ideas and you're trying to explain them to an audience who might be new to them for the first time. They might already have context, but you're just trying to kind of give them that information. You're trying to kind of tell that story. And so in that sense, it's not that different. Um, but I think the best thing that I took from those experiences, and I, I used to go on TV a lot, you know, there were times, especially if it was not an election year, uh, because obviously when uh, politics is happening, that's all the TV producers want. I mean, there were times I would go on TV, you know, three, four, sometimes five times a week, um, just to do little, you know, five minute, you know, uh, hits, you know, on, on various uh, cable uh, channels. When you do live television, that's a different context than um, doing something pre-recorded, And you have to learn to kind of be able to think on your feet and deal with things that might happen that might not be like awesome. Like sometimes there might be either a technical failure or someone asks you a question that you aren't prepared for. And what's was great about that experience is that now that I do live streams and I do public speaking and I do live interviews with people, uh, you know, at, at conferences like Microsoft Build and Microsoft Ignite, I have that experience of being like, okay, I know what this is like. I, I have mm -hmm. hundreds of hours of experience of doing this before, and so in, in that sense, like I actually am so grateful I had that experience because you kind of know the power of live. And also you can kind of get over a little bit. You're like, okay, if something goes wrong, it goes wrong. You deal with it, you know? Well, that's what I think is so impressive because what you do to be able to take something very technical and then make it something ingestible for all of the audience, no matter what level, that is not an easy thing to do. And I think it's super impressive. Um, it's what I've started to notice when I'm reading various blogs from the CDA community is, you know, is that something I can understand? And if it is, I, I share it because that means anybody can understand it. And I think your story amplifies that you don't have to just start in tech to take your background and be successful. So I've taken my hospitality and, and project management background, and now I'm using it for what I do in, in Microsoft. And so I think it, it's something for the audience to listen to that you don't have to start in tech to be successful in tech. And I know I watched a really impressive interview with you um, when we were doing uh, ver um, live Ignite. And you did an interview basically saying that your role as a CA in Microsoft is a bit different than most, basically what you just highlighted. But I would love to share with the audience, they always ask us, how did you get into tech? How did other people get into tech? Um, you know, what what does your role look like? And, and you mentioned in the interview that your role as a CA is a bit different than some of the others. So I'd love to hear how you went from this film girl to mm -hmm. Microsoft CA. Tell us about that and, and a little bit more about how your role as a CA in specific is a bit different than others. Yeah, sure thing. Um, and, yeah. and I just want to kind of go back and, and reiterate what you just said, which is that you don't have to start out in tech to be able to do really well in tech. A lot of the skills that you have in other areas can be really useful. And, and we need and them. We need all we do. the skills. We, we, we yeah. do need them. We need all the skills and we need that background and we need people yes. who have different perspectives. Like I think it's really, really important. And so, yeah, so how I got into tech, yeah. I mean, I started building websites when I was like 12 or 13 and I was always interested in technology and I, I was always good with it, but I didn't study computer science in college. Um, I studied film which is why my Twitter name is what it is. I didn't know when I signed up for a Twitter account that it would be my online identity all these years later, but <laughs> here we are. Um, and, uh, but, but I was, I was always interested in uh, a bunch of different things and mostly web stuff. And, and I, I just kind of got computers, but it was one of those things that when I, I, I graduated from college, uh, like right when the great recession happened in the United States. And that was, a scary time and I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. And I, I kind of fell into journalism and then kind of 
continued with that and was successful. But I was always writing about tech things and I was very technical for a journalist. Then when I came to Microsoft, I, I was like, oh, okay. I have to skill up a little bit more, you know, um, uh, I, not, not that I, you know, I wasn't competent, but it was one of those things I was like, I need to actually be able to, uh, to, to do more and learn more, which I love, I love to learn, but it is one of those things where you, you kind of have to flip a little bit where you're going late. I'm used to being the person who has to kind of dumb things down and is usually asking the hardest questions, you know, the, the people that I'm interviewing and, and can go really deep into stuff and has editors who are saying, okay, this is, this is a little bit too complex. How, how do we, you know, make this more approachable to going on the flip side of me and like, okay, I need to go a little bit deeper into this. And, um, but yeah, I mean, my, my, my technology kind of career, I, I was approached by somebody on LinkedIn for the Microsoft job, to be honest, like that's how that happened for me. And um, I, I certainly had some imposter syndrome, I think even going through the interview process. And it was funny because when I was in the interview and I was actually whiteboarding something, it clicked and I realized, and I wasn't even talking about a technical issue at that point. I was, I was explaining something else and it clicked and I was like, I've got this, I can do yeah. this. But it took me until the interview, like the, like the long loop that you go through to actually feel like, I, 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 I'm qualified for this. Even if I don't get this job, I was good enough to be here in this space. When you're thrown and into the fire, you know what you can and can't do. <laughs> totally, totally. But but I always try to point that out to people because I, I think that it's important that we can all be scared and we can all have like those moments where you're just like, I don't know if I can do this. And I was in the interview and I went, you know what, even if I don't get this job, I, I was able to be here. Like this, this is completely okay. Um, but as you mentioned, yeah, my job, my, my, my job is a little bit different than some of the other CAs. So a lot of the other, uh, advocates focus on a specific te technology area and they can go really deep into that. And I'm a little bit different because I'm kind of, you know, a, a, a T-shaped engineer, I think is, is a term <laughs> I like a lot. My, I might also say jack of all traits, master of none. I'm somebody who <laughs> I like a bunch of different things. I know a lot about a bunch of different things. That doesn't mean I can go super deep onto all of them. I, I can understand the gist and I can point you to, to somebody who can, but I'm somebody who I know a lot about a lot of things, but if we need to go really deep, I'm not necessarily going to be your person. I can point you to someone who is. And so my role, I really think of myself in some ways as kind of being a facilitator and a storyteller and figuring out who are the right people I can talk to and learn from and tell their stories and get those out to an audience so that people can learn from them. And that really comes directly from my background, you know, in journalism uh, and the fact that I've been telling stories and I've been trying to tell developer stories my whole career. Now it's just a little bit of a different context and um, with, with a little more focus and, and I've obviously learned a ton over the last four years too, which has been oh, fantastic. Sure. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of the, you know, most people have one specific area and I'm kind of like, no, nope, I, I like it all. Or, you know, I, I, I will jump in and try to learn what I can and, and, and touch a lot of different things. But yeah. that's what the episode when we had Stephen Rose, remember that Izzy, he talked about how yeah. important it is. I think we all love him. Um, but that was the one thing he said is that you don't have to be super technically deep on everything, but you yeah. have to be able to be a connector and a relationship builder and how important those skills are. So you just amplified what, what we've been hearing um, across the board. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Christina. And you are, I mean, really inspirational. Um, you're a true spark of energy. You really light up every conference. Uh, I've seen you, let's say, do your thing, right? <laughs> Um, so from Microsoft Ignite to Hello World, uh, Channel 9, uh, Microsoft Build, I mean, so much more. Um, so speaking of Microsoft Build, as we are in our May episode, it is also the month that uh, Microsoft Build is going to happen in a few weeks. So uh, I believe you are very much involved, right, into uh, yeah. into hosting the event, uh, uh, being a CDA. So please tell us, for the people who don't know Microsoft Build, just a little bit more background about the conference, which is now for the second year a digital experience, and how uh, you are involved into the event. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you said, it, it's the second year that it's the All Digital Experience. It's taking place May 25th through the 27th. Um, those are the U.S. dates, so it might be the 26th through the 28th if you're in Europe or um, other parts of the world. Um, but it is it is Microsoft's big developer conference, and, and it's really our place where we kind of want to show off all the latest things that are happening in our developer uh, our developer 
developer and tooling space. So there's going to be tons of news around Azure, news around Visual Studio, news around our, our programming languages like like C Sharp, and and TypeScript and and other things. And it's just a really uh, good time. It's also you know we've been focusing more and more over the last few years on even some of the um, low code and, and no code solutions like Power Platform. Mm -hmm. And so you know kind of all the ways that people are building things. You know Microsoft. One of the things that I've always loved about the company and that that I loved when I was a kid and and I would you know use Microsoft stuff and and that I appreciated as a journalist and that now I love as an employee is like at its heart, I think Microsoft has always been kind of a, a company who builds tools for people who build things. Yeah. And and build is a perfect name then, right? Because that's really what it's about. It's like, these are the things that you can use to get your job done, to create your next project, to work at your company, to have your next idea. And uh, it, it's a great event. Um, it, it's a digital experience. I'm. We've got a, a number of, of hosts this year, um, actually more than we've had before. So if you go to mybuild.microsoft.com, you can register. But we'll we'll have um, you know a, a lot of great um, interviews. There are going to be a lot of great you know sessions and, and content. Um, great learning opportunities even after the event. So it's going to be a really good time, and I'm I'm ecstatic to be part of it again. And I'm so grateful they keep asking me to, to participate because I, I love it. And uh, it, it's, I, I have to pinch myself a little bit because, you know, <laughs> I used to cover these events as a journalist, right? I used to be in the audience oh, as a okay. journalist. And now I'm like, you know, somebody who's who's on stage and, and, and talking to people. And that's, that's, that's kind of awesome. I'm not going to lie. No, that's a huge, huge privilege. And I, I like what you highlighted about how micro, Microsoft is so forward thinking, right? Um, as soon as the pandemic hit, we just started to come out with all these new ways to work from home and get our kids engaged in a safe and secure manner. And I, so, yes, we're still building on top of what we're building. Um, and we're very in in the grain of what's happening live. So, no, that's exciting to see. So hopefully everybody listening will register for Microsoft Build and watch Christina do her thing on stage virtually. You know, in this show, we love to, like we said, we love to talk about tech. Um, we love to share career stories like we've already hit on, but but Izzy and I, we love to humanize the, the technology. You know, no matter who the guest is, we wanna show that there's a human behind the technology, not just the piece of technology that they're working on. So I know you have a huge following. You've got an impressive background, your own wiki page, which is pretty cool. Um, but tell, but tell us something about yourself that the audience probably wouldn't really know about you. Just some kind of fun fact. Um, okay. Well, uh, I'm in my office right now, and and it's a mess, unfortunately. I, or else I'll show more of it. But um, I, I love to collect. Uh, like kind of, you know, like movie nerd TV memorabilia stuff. I love to collect those sorts of things. So that might be something people don't know about me. Um, I also love shoes. Um, I love clothes. Um, and, and you know, the pandemic has been difficult for that because, you know, you buy too many things and you're like, well, I'm not going to wear it all, right? But, yeah. but uh, uh, yeah, um, th I guess those those are some of the things. I'm, I'm a big... Uh, I'm a big fan of, of, of collecting stuff. And so okay. I still have, I still have DVDs and Blu-rays. Like I still actually have physical <laughs> media. I can't get rid of them. Like I don't watch them, but I can't get rid of them. I'm like, oh no, they're like my, you know. <laughs> you can sell them one day and retire off all the money you're making from yeah. your collectible. The, 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 the tens of cents that I will get for, 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 for this. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Well, that's that. That's good to know. And then, uh, Christina, another thing that we see a lot in our in our series is how people, whether if we ask the question or not, often talk about mentorship. So somebody who guided them through their tech journey or their career, um, or whatever stage in their life. So. Um, I would like to ask the question you like, do you have somebody or more than one person in your life who you would consider as, um, yeah, as a mentor and what's the value of mentorship to you? Yeah, it's a great question. And I've, I've had, I've had a number of mentors over the years and people who've been really great and wonderful to me. And, um, I think that the mentor, I'll start with the, the, the second question first. I think the value of mentorship is huge. I think having someone who can believe in you and someone who will advocate for you <laughs> is massive. And, uh, and on the flip side, I think that when you have the opportunity to advocate for someone else and, and to believe in them and to give them, uh, you know, uh, encouragement, um, and, and to, you know, try to pass Try to pay it forward. That's an excellent opportunity. I'm I'm now at that stage in, in my life where I I you know have people who are asking me for mentorship, and I'm 
honored and, and, and grateful to be able to do that. There have been a number of people in my career who've really helped me. I would say uh, my, uh, my boss for many years, I worked at a website called Mashable for a long time. I was there for seven years and, and we went from nine people when I joined. It was over 300 people, you know, at kind of its peak. And, and I really saw, you know, that kind of go through its, its whole, you know, journey in, in kind of startup them. And um, I had a, had a mentor, Jim Roberts, who um, he was at the New York Times for 27 years and he was on the masthead there, which means that he was one of like, that's there are only a few people who who kind of you know reach those ranks and and he um, he was our our editor for for a number of years and he was a great mentor for me in part because we didn't always get along we would fight yeah. when we, and he would he would push back on me and I would push back on him but I look back on that time and I'm like I'm so grateful that I had someone who would push me because I think that yeah. for me a lot of times that's really what I need that I need somebody who's gonna to to, to call me on my stuff, right? Like, uh, I, I, I have, uh, I can have an overpowering personality and I know that. And as a result, that means that I can sometimes just power through and bulldoze through people, especially managers. And that's actually not a good thing. Um, both I think for your career development and also just for your kind of growth as a person, it's good to be able to, um, not always be able to be in that place where you're just like, Oh, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do anyway. And this, they're, they're not going to stop me because they don't know how. Right. Um, and, and, and Jim would push back and I would push back on him. And what was great, I think what really was, and I don't think he would mind me, me sharing this. Um, we both went to different places and, and, and did different things. And, and a couple of years ago, he reached out to me for some advice on how to handle a certain situation and um, kind of an, how to approach something. And, um, I was really honored that he asked for my feedback in that way because that, you know, he was kind of talking to me like a peer, you know, and, and that really, I, I, I can't even, uh, pretend that that wasn't completely just, you know, humbling and, and really important. So, so I think about Jim Roberts, there were also a number of women who helped me, um, in my career, um, uh, uh Stacey Martinet, who's now, um, a VP at Adobe was, uh, uh Mashable's head of marketing, and she was instrumental in moving me to New York and getting me on TV and really growing my career in that way. Uh, uh, Sharon Federer Hirsch, who was our COO, uh, she hired me and kind of took a chance on me and also really gave me a ton of support. This was this was all at Mashable. Um, uh, uh, Katie Drummond, who hired me at Gizmodo, was great. My first manager at Microsoft, uh, Luke Niswanger, really was an amazing uh, mentor. He was only my manager for a brief period of time, but he really showed me the ropes of being at a tech company and I couldn't have asked for a better first manager. Tim Hewer, who was my manager um, after that, who's uh, still at Microsoft, but but he's a, in a different team now, an amazing, amazing person. And uh, there, there are just countless others, but what I always, I've always loved having interns and mm -hmm. I've always loved trying to, um, you know, anytime I could help other people help them because I always remember what it was like to be new to something and the people who were kind to me and who helped me and gave me encouragement or pushback or support or whatever the case may be, because you don't have, people don't, people don't have to do that. And mm -hmm. so when they do, it's wonderful. And it's also, I always try to like, keep myself grounded and so okay okay do that for the next person that, that you see help the next person when you can because it, it can change someone's life and and people can have an impact on your life who might not even think the thing they're doing could change the, tra the trajectory of what someone else is doing but it, but it can I, I we've heard this theme throughout all of the 14 episodes about how powerful mentorship is and I like when you highlight about the the mentor that will push back at you. Um, I have a mentor, Mary Rodriguez, who's now become a dear friend of mine. And I'll never forget sitting there in the Microsoft event building. And she said, you're going to go and open a Twitter account. If you want to have a voice and you want to be on stage and you want to present, you better get used to it. So you're going to open Twitter. And I just remember feeling like sick to my stomach. I, I didn't know what to do. And now looking back, I'm so happy that she did push me because if she didn't, when you just said, they never know how they're going to be a part of that trajectory of your life. Izzy and I may not have met because we met on right. Twitter. We might not be doing this show right now. So her pushing me to go out of my comfort zone 
created this whole world that I would have never have experienced, you know? And so part of her pushing me was encouraging me to brand myself. And part of this show is a piece of our brand that we've created together. And quite often, you know, my friends or community will say, oh, is this part of your job? Nope. It's just something I love. It's how I'm building my brand or when I'm saying, oh, I want to go get headshots or I want to go do this post or this thing. I have this idea. People say, why are you, why are you doing this? This is outside of your box. You're not getting paid for it. Yes, this is your free time. And one, I love it. You know, um, Mm -hmm. Mary's advice has really given me something that I'm passionate about. So I know personally for me, what branding has done, we talked about your brand as film girl and how you had no idea. What's your experience? And for those listening, what would you say the power of branding and and the time, the worth, you know, the effort, the the Uh, impact it can have, what would you share? I mean, it's, it's unreal. Uh, I think that I I would want to start and I would say, if you don't feel like that's something that's really important for you to have, not to stress out too much about right. it, right? So that that would be the first thing I would say because I think some people hear this and they think, oh, well, I, I don't wanna do this or maybe that's not what I wanna do. But if you do have aspirations, like you wanted to speak more, you wanted to, mm-hmm. to have those opportunities, yeah, being able to share more about yourself and kind of have a brand and an online persona um, and being open to being able to meet other people can be invaluable as you learned. And I'm so glad that you opened that Twitter account and, and yeah. that you were able to communicate with people and meet people. Cause I think that it can unlock just so many great mm-hmm. things. And, and you met Izzy and you're doing the show. And, you know, for me, um, I, I would be lying if I said that I hadn't considered while my my Twitter brand, especially because that was the first one where I really started to have a following. And and I I, I was early to Twitter and I gained a following fairly quickly and then it grew and, and I continued to grow it um, from that point. I would be lying if I said that some of it wasn't intentional and if I wasn't aware at mm-hmm. a certain point, of you course. know, a, about what it meant. Um, but I have to say, you know, again, like when I signed up, I didn't really know what I was getting into and, and it, it wasn't done with a lot of forethought. It was just like, I, this is this thing. It's, it, it was 2007. I was in college. It was, you know, I'm I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing, you know, like uh, pe- more people still used MySpace, right? Like I think Facebook <laughs> was still, I think Facebook was still college only at that point. Um, it might've just swapped, uh, you know, to, to being open to everyone. And, and so, um, but what that did is, is it, I, 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 I always try to encourage people try to be yourself. Now there are, there are limits to that, right? Like, like there, there are limits to how much you want to share and be open about because being too open about certain things and, and, you know, uh, like going off the rails, sometimes that's that's (laughs) not always the best idea. Right. But, but I would say being authentic is, is my biggest advice. And I was lucky, I think in the sense that a, I was early and I was able to kind of, you know, people who were interesting, um, found me and, and liked me and, and would, you know, talk with me and whatnot, but I, I just, um, I was authentic. I, I think that would be why maybe the thing I would kind of take from it is, is that I've, I've tried to be myself. Like, is I, I think most people when they meet me in person, they would go, Oh yeah, you're not that different than you are online. Yeah. I'm like, right. I'm, I'm pretty much the same. Um, you know, so it can be a little bit heightened, can be a little bit different, but, it, but it's authentic. And I think that the power of that can be that people get to know your intentions and, um, also, you know, a little bit about who you are and that can really help in a career context because Mm -hmm. people see you as more than just whatever your job is. Right. Like when I joined Microsoft, I had been, I was an Apple beat reporter. Like that was the main thing that I was kind of known for. I would say if anything was that I was someone who was very much, not just like covered the company, but very involved in that community. I know those developers, I know, you know, that story. And so going to Microsoft, even though Microsoft is a very different place than it was, you know, 20, you know, 25 years ago, a lot of people were like, huh, that's interesting. But they had to kind of ask the question. They're like, well, why would, why would Christina, you know, go to Microsoft? Well, if Christina's going to Microsoft, maybe something's happening there that we didn't think. And maybe something's happening there that's different than what like our impression was. And, um, and over time, you know, people get to kind of know you and trust you. And if they see that you're authentic, then if you're saying, Hey, this thing is really cool at least my experience, people are more likely to take it seriously and look at it and want to investigate it than, you know, if you don't have any personality, you're not really being authentic and you're just, you know, putting out stuff for your employer or, or putting out, you know, just, just pithy comments, you know, 
the, the stuff you think people are going to want to say it, it, and, and also not engaging, right? Like, I think that um, this is especially important when you're talking about kind of growing who you are because mm -hmm. what your brand is, and, and I made this mistake a, a few times earlier in my career where most of what I would tweet out or post on Facebook or post on other things were all about my employer. And I kind of gave oh. my brand and I kind of gave myself over to them. And I, I realized at a certain point, I was like, why am I doing this? Like, this is going to outlast whatever my current role is. Yeah. And when I realized that and was like, no, I'm just going to do this stuff for me. I found that I had a lot more engagement. I had a lot, I met a lot more people. I had more opportunities. Um, I've had so many opportunities from being online. I, I can't even explain it. I mean, I'm doing this, this, this um, interview with you right now because of online, right? Like, let's, let's be honest. Yes, I work at Microsoft, but you know me because <laughs> of online, you know, I've had job opportunities. I've had other um, opportunities. And when I realized that like what I'm doing, I'm doing it for me and I'm doing it because it's going to outlast what I, I hope to be at Microsoft a long time, but it's going to outlast my current role. It's going to be, it's bigger than that. And it belongs to me. And when I viewed it that way, then for me, it was like, okay, then this is something that I'm going to a take seriously, but B treat preciously because yeah. it, it doesn't belong to my employer and it, and it doesn't, you know, have to follow, you know, certain standards. This is just going to be, you know, my space for me to kind of express who I am. And yeah. I've been lucky that it's been successful. Yeah, I think I think that's very valuable advice, especially now, right? As as we are like pivoting to this mm -hmm. online virtual uh, world, doing uh, doing many of our activities uh, that we used to do offline in the past, doing them online right now. Um, yeah. So speaking on that topic earlier in the interview, you mentioned also your role as a CDA. So like before the pandemic and after the pandemic. And um, um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of that has changed. So what's the biggest impact on you? So not looking at work, but like personally. So what has been like the biggest impact for you as a person in your private life? And secondly, also, of course, in your role as a CDA. Yeah, I mean, so I, uh, I used to travel all the time. And I, I would spend about six months of the year, you know, traveling really heavily and about six months, you know, at, at home and home now is Seattle. I used to be in New York and now I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in uh, sunny at uh, sunny today anyway, Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that for me, the, the hardest thing and the biggest change and, and uh, it, it has been difficult in some ways, and in some ways, you know, you, you get to know your resilience and you get to know people better in some contexts, but um, I'm a pretty social person and I love to see people. And so not being able to yeah. see people in person it's been really difficult. You know, our team, we were already remote uh, first and we had people all mm -hmm. over the world. Yeah. But because we traveled a lot and we would see each other at conferences, we really felt like we got to know one another and really got to feel right. like we had those in-person experiences. And I love knowing people online. I have far more online relationships than I do offline ones, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. But usually you have those interspersed with times when you can see people in person. And so I think that for me, the biggest thing personally has just been not being able to see my friends because people are all over the place and, and I, I, I can't see them. You know, I'm, um, I'm flying out later uh, tonight to see my family for the first time um, since January 2020. And, uh, you know, like that's that's kind of nuts. Uh, and and I'm I'm super excited that I'm I'm fully vaccinated and I'm able to fly and, and go home and, yeah. and see my mom and my dad and my sister. Um, but then on the career side, I would say, you know, the way that the role has changed, well, we were kind of thrown into what are we going to do? You know, I mean, like everyone else. And, and so you could do, you do the, you, everybody gets on teams, everybody, you know, starts to get on video calls and everybody's trying to buy cameras and this and that. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, from an event standpoint, I think that was almost, a little bit easier at first to kind of stand up and go, okay, we know we can virtualize this yeah. and we can get this done. But so much of what we do as, as CDAs is, is speaking at conferences and speaking at community events. And so then it's about, okay, well, how do we still connect with their community online? And how do we still connect with them in places where they're not being overwhelmed? And so at first, you know, we went through the process where we were, I think all of us were just speaking at tons and tons of online conferences. And I think we certainly as speakers, but also I, most certainly as attendees, because I also attend a lot of conferences, I think we all got a little bit conference style. I think we were all like, we have a little bit of fatigue here. Like this is, you know, a little bit overwhelming. 
But then we sort of try to figure out, okay, well, what are other ways we can um, engage? And so we have Hello World, which is like our, our, our live kind of morning show, and I contribute to that. And we have other people who do other live streams. And, you know, we people have, you know, um, a, a Twitter chats and or, a, you know, clubhouse um, things. People are in Discord. You know, you, you find other ways, I think, to try to build that community. And um, I'm really glad to say I think that that's continued and I think that like the show that, that you two are doing is a great example of that where you're still bringing people in Thank and you. still connecting because you can still do it um, remotely it's just different and so but, but I would say like I I can't wait for things to open <laughs> um, up again and for us all to be able to see each other in person but what I think is going to be great about it is that a we're all going to be so excited to see one another but b <laughs> You know, leading up to this, and I would say this was true both for the advocacy work and and for events in general. But but I would say, what a, a lot of what we did, we very much focused on the in person first and foremost, mm -hmm. and like that was the primary thing. And anything that was happening, you know, um, online was like secondary at best, right? It was kind of a, a an afterthought. Yeah. And I don't. That's not going to be the case anymore. And that's actually really incredible because. A, yes, we will have in-person opportunities, which we're all excited about, but we're still going to have, it's not like people are going to stop communicating online and people are going to stop engaging that way. And we're, we've had to become, I think, more thoughtful about how we do that and about how we're not overwhelming, how we can do it in the right way. And what's great, I think, about what I'm hoping about, you know, this online stuff still being a first-class citizen is that what's been great about events like Microsoft Build, Microsoft Ignite, is that more people than ever before have been able to attend because people yeah. who wouldn't otherwise be able to travel across the world or take yeah. the time off of work or get a babysitter or you know do what that might be have still been able to attend and participate. And that's unbelievably powerful. And so what my hope is, is that we'll have these in-person opportunities because we all need that and that's important, but we're no longer going to treat the online experience as an afterthought. It's still going right. to be considered as important as, as the rest. And, and hopefully yeah. that means more people will be able to engage and our communities can just get bigger rather than maybe being siloed the way they were before. It's made us think outside of the box, you know. Um, and as we as we go to close the show, all all I want to do is say thank you for being on. Um, thank you for being an example for someone like myself who knows, you know, branding is important, mentorship is important, and just watching you, you know, online and seeing the the impact and power that online can have. Like I said, your tweets make me think. I love them. I started to follow you simply because they were unique and special. And you and I have had a few online Twitter chats and it's been so fun. So I just want to say thank you for everything you've shared with us today and, and reminding us of what's possible and to continue to think outside of the box. Oh, thank you so much. That makes me feel so good. I love talking with you on online and, and um, that's, that's so nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. Christina has been a true uh, inspirational to, uh, to listen to your story and your background and your way into tech and your CDA role and, um, basically everything that keeps you uh, keeps you busy and I think far most important of everything is that you're going to see your family so I really yes. wish you a wonderful time um, enjoy enjoy the cuddles enjoy the hugs um, never ever take it for granted right no. I mean, no. uh, I think that's what we're all taking from this last year right yeah. I took it for granted that I could always hop on a plane and see my yeah. family I will never do that again I will never take no. that for granted again yeah, I totally, uh, totally feel you. I had the same. I mean, I, I switched countries because uh, I followed wow. my heart uh, from Amsterdam to Switzerland mm -hmm. with the thought like, oh, yeah, I can just go home every month. Go home. And now it has been a very long time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hopefully I can uh, hop on a plane or on a train uh, anytime uh, in, in, in the upcoming months as well. So, Christina, thanks once again. Mm -hmm. um, thanks to everybody who's been watching or listening uh, episode 14. We hope you enjoyed. We hope you learned. We hope you got inspired. And, of course, if you did not subscribe yet, make sure you subscribe, subscribe. to our YouTube channel and keep following uh, our ongoing journey. So, thank you, everyone. And, Christina, before we end, we always show our heart. <laughs> All right. Take care.